And turn with us tonight to the book of Leviticus. Those clean white pages in the fronts of your King James Bible. Leviticus chapter number four. Um, appreciate David up there oh, reminding me every time I forget to turn this on and all the other stuff he does to try to keep me straight. I appreciate that. And that's a great title you gave the message Sunday night when I uh, looked up, uh, looked it up this week just to see if it was on there. And, and I thought, man, that's an awesome title. I wish I'd have thought of that. Um, but appreciate the Lord. And, and glad that, you know, who knows what God's doing with that. But uh, I just pray that God does something with it. And, yeah. and I just thank him for uh, the opportunities that we have to do things like that. And it's so well done, and I thank God for it. So uh, we're in Leviticus chapter number 4, and we are working our way through uh, the five offerings. Now, uh, if you don't have notes, we still have some that's up here. You're welcome to them. Uh, if you want some, just raise your hand. If you don't have them, and we'll get them to you. Uh, but we're on chapter number four. Now, when when they came through the wilderness and were in Mount Sinai, uh, God had given Moses instructions on the mountain on exactly how to build the temple, what to build it out of, how big it was to be, and all of those things, the exact design of it, the furniture in it, and all of those other things. And now in Leviticus, he's now telling them how to use the temple and how they're to approach God. And how in, uh, you know, it's one thing to have a building, but without God in the building, number one, it's worthless. And then without we know how to get to God, then uh, also it's in vain. But grateful that God made a way for them then, and he has made a way for us now. Uh, yeah. We have a sacrifice, and these offerings were but a shadow of good things to come. And so that brings us to chapter number four. We've made it through the first three offerings, which I'll remind you were voluntary offerings. They were offerings, uh, the burnt offering, the meat offering, and then the peace offering. All three of these were different offerings. They were for different reasons. And each one of them uh, described for us Christ, his person, who he was and how he was offered, and how we have a relationship with him and through him, and, and how he brings us to God. So the first three offerings clearly were showing us the person of Christ, and then the next two off offerings will declare unto us uh, the work of Christ. Now, uh, you can't separate the person of Christ from the work of Christ, and yet God did it for the children of Israel through these five different offerings. It's, it's like looking at the, the most beautiful diamonds you've ever seen and it be five carats individually and you just see the beauty of each one of them and how they describe the preciousness of Christ but also now as we look at the works of Christ. So that brings us to the last two. We, uh, I hope we'll get through this one tonight, well, I don't say I hope. We may get through the sin offering tonight. If we don't, we'll finish it next time and tackle the trespass offering then. But uh, we're going to deal with the sin offering tonight. And I'm going to give us some things to look at as far as summary goes as we begin to dive into the text itself and see what God said to Moses. But remind yourself now that this is God on his throne speaking directly to Moses, his appointed ambassador for the children of Israel, and he is telling them directly from glory what he wants done and how he wants this offering to be kept. The sin offering is for the sin nature of man, while the trespass offering, which we'll tackle in chapter number 5, is for the act of sin. So we have the sin offering, which is for the sin nature of man, while the trespass offering is for the act itself. You say, what's the difference? There are some sins that you can commit ignorantly, and God has made a way that those sins can be paid for, even though you did them ignorantly, you're still guilty of them, yep. and God made a way. So there, there is a sin nature within man, but then there's the sins we commit. Not only 
are you a sinner by nature, but you're a sinner by act, right? There are things you do deliberately. Um, I started to say every day, but that may not be true, right? You, you may not sin but one time a week deliberately. Now, that's probably a stretch, but, but regardless, you see the difference. A, a child, uh, I'm just going to use Harper's, and she don't know any difference. As, as an example tonight, she, she is as innocent of anybody in this room. But she has a sin nature. Now, what we know about pride and selfishness is that that is a sin. Now, by nature, Harper will be prideful and selfish. You don't have to teach a child that. Somebody that's a mother say amen. You don't have to teach children the bad stuff. You got to teach them the good stuff. Why is that? Because they have a sin nature. You say, even babies, yes, yes. They're born after the sin of Adam because they're a human. They inherit that initial sin. That original sin is the doctrine we use. But, but they have that original sin. They have that sin nature. Now, she has the capabilities to sin, right, and commit sin. But right now, she has no idea she's sinning, right? Because she's a child, right? And so, and yet God made a way. See, that, that sin that is done ignorantly via our sin nature was taken care of. And so he gave two offerings, therefore, for sin. One being the sin nature of man and the other being the act of sin that we commit deliberately. So one is a sin that is a sin we're ignorant of while the other is a sin that we knew full well what we did and, and we had motive or, or deliberateness to do it. And so you're a sinner on both accounts. Amen. That feels good, right? Just pat you on the back right out of the gate and say, you're a sinner. You have violated God's law twice over. Yep. One, by just breathing. Because you're a sinner by nature. But then there's also the sins that you actually commit. And both of them, God provided a sacrifice for. Let's dive into it. The sin nature, the offering that was given, and this is what's called the sin offering. It was given according to uh, the first two verses there. You'll find if a soul sin, shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning the things which ought not to be done and shall do it against any of them. And then verse number three starts in depending on who have who has sinned ignorantly. But notice that, that what he begins the chapter with is the fact that these are sins that are done in ignorance. Now, I'm going to bring you some New Testament scripture in here and share with what the Apostle Paul said about ignorant sins done in ignorance and, what, and, and how it affected him. So we'll try to tie that back together here in a minute. But just so you know that it's relevant, all of these things are pictures of things that are coming. The better thing, which is Christ, which is the greatest offering for sin. Now, the sin nature, these are things that were done in ignorance. And the sin nature, the offering of Jesus Christ for our sin nature, right? This is the work that Jesus did on the cross as he suffered for my sins, as he took them on himself and he bled and died using his blood as the payment for my sin debt. He paid for all of my sin. Now, that works for my relationship, right? And in order for you to get to heaven, you must have a relationship with God, right? You have to receive the, the sacrifice, the sin offering of Jesus Christ. In order to be a believer, you're going to have to experience that sin offering of Christ, right? But what the Bible said the gospel was is believing in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the gospel. That's the power of, of God unto salvation. The gospel that Jesus bore your sins, paid for them as a substitution in your place, 
and therefore made a way that you could be reconciled unto God and have a relationship with him. When you get born again, that establishes a relationship with God and that was done through the sin offering of Jesus Christ. Amen? That's how you get saved. But you get, a, you get a relationship when you get saved. Now, the sin act, that affects your fellowship. If you deliberately sin against God, you understand that that sin will separate you from fellowship with God. Right? That sin will keep you from experiencing the Holy Spirit of Christ in a freedom and a, and a witness that bears witness with our heart. These are, the, that affects your fellowship. But the sin nature, the sin offering, that's where your relationship with Christ begins. It's through that sin offering. And Christ is that offering. We see, uh, I've got it in the notes here that uh, it, it's, it's, I thought it was interesting to note that chapter number one dealing with the burnt offering and then two with the meat offering or meal offering and then three with the peace offering, they had similar size chapters, each one of them about 16 to 19 verses. And even when you get to the trespass offering, there was about uh, 16, 17 verses given to chapter number five and the trespass offering. But the sin offering, there are 35 verses. Um, I don't know if that's exactly relevant, but I would say that it's important to note that a lot of emphasis is given to chapter number four and the sin offering. Now, here's one reason why. The sin offering did not exist until this time, right? There was not a sin offering that was mandatory. Remember, the first three offerings were the sweet-smelling savor offerings unto God that were, were, were burnt offerings, and and they were all voluntary. But when it comes to the sin offering, it's not voluntary. It is required. And don't you know that both of those things was required of Christ? He had to both volunteer, and then it was also required of him. He volunteered to come and to take on my sin and your sin, but it was also a requirement of God in order to save you. And so both of those things represented in the voluntary and the required offerings of these first five offerings that shared. Now, what we see, I believe, is, is the difference between uh, what, what happened before Abel's offering, Noah's offering, Abraham's offering, Isaac's offering, all of those offerings up to the point when Moses goes into the wilderness and then onto the mount of God and he receives the law. All of those three offerings were in place. But when the sin offering is introduced, friend, everything changes. Now, it doesn't, it doesn't take away the voluntary offerings. No, those still speak to the person of Christ and they're still voluntary offerings the children of Israel made unto God. And we should still be offering voluntarily our, 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 off, our offer of works and service to Christ in, in simple voluntary willingness because we love him. But also note that, friend, you're going to have to offer unto God what he's required of you. Now, what's the difference? What, what makes this sin offering different than the burn offering? And, and we've, we made it clear that the first three are telling us about the person of Christ while the other two are telling us about the work of Christ. But let's see if we can look at it a little different way. What did God get or what did Moses get from God on the mountain? The law. He got the law. And the law changed everything. Let's see if we can read some scripture that will help us understand that. Uh, let's see. I had noted earlier where that scripture was. Romans three nineteen. Now we know that whatsoever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Before the law, there was no imputing of sin. What the Apostle Paul would say is, how can you impute sin where there is no law? But at the giving of the law, man became guilty. Right? Not that they weren't sinners, and that's why those voluntary offerings were there. 
But when the law came, and right, the law did not come until Moses. God gave Moses the law, and he gave him all of the ordinances and all of the things that had to be kept according to God's commandment. All of those things were given to Moses. When he came off that mountain with the law and the ordinances of God, another offering had to be given. Why? Because man is now guilty in the eyes of God. He could not be guilty before God before the law. Now, he was still a sinner, and therefore those first offerings cover that sin. But yet what we find is when the law came, it stopped everyone's mouth because everyone is under the law, and that set them up to be guilty before God. And therefore, the Bible, or the Bible says that Scripture hath concluded all under sin, so that all might be saved. God has made all guilty of the law. Now, say, preacher, I'm not guilty of the law. I've kept it all. Well, the Bible says you have it, right? That there is none good, no, not one. So we find that this offering could not have been made until the law was given. And from the time of the giving of the law, the sin offering became the most important and significant offering of all the offerings. It was offered during all of the feasts, Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Great Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, which brought the high priest into the holiest of holies. Now, the sin offering was the offering that was given at every feast, at every function that, that Israel had. It was then the sin offering that was given unto God. And, and note, again, it was for the sin nature of man, which excluded nobody. It involved everyone, even to, the, to the, what they call Yom Kippur today. But, but to us, what we, we recall in, in the Old Testament was it, it was, the, it was that one day a year that the high priest went into the holiest of holies, right? They were in the holy place every day. Replacing the she bread, keeping the, the lamps burning, keeping the incense burning, which was continuous prayer. And so they were in there every day, but they did not go behind that curtain, but once a year. And then they could not go in without blood. Blood of what? Blood of the sin offering. It was this offering. So up to this point, Moses had never heard of a sin offering. Not, not in this regard, but because the law came. There had to be some way to save them from their sin. And that's what God did even then. <laughs> what a picture of God's grace. That at the very time he gave the law, he also gave a way for you to be saved from it. Right? Because what God knew from the very beginning is that we wouldn't be able to keep the law. Certainly not in its entirety, and for the most part, not at all. Yeah. Not perfectly. And so God made a way from the beginning. From the introduction of the law, he had a remedy right then. Right? He didn't just lay the law on them and say, you're guilty and everybody's going to hell. No, at the time he gave the law, he also gave the sin offering and said, but if you'll bring to me this offering and you'll do this with it, and, and we'll go through what, what the, the ritual actually is. And he said that was to make an atonement for their sin nature. What a beautiful picture. In comparison to the burnt offering, it was offered at the same place, but the sin offering went beyond the burnt the offering of, of burnt or the altar of burnt offerings. Right, that was the big altar where the wood was there, and, and it was always burning, and they were they were doing all kinds of offerings right there around it. They were killing all kinds of animals, and and some were burnt offerings, and some were meat offerings, and some were peace offerings, and 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 there were all kinds of things going on around this giant. 
um, uh, altar where, where the fire was going up unto God continuously. But the sin offering, they did something different. They would kill the bullock there at the altar of the burnt offering, but the first thing they had to do was to take the blood and they had to go farther with it, right? So this is the first time that we see the blood of the animal, right? Before the blood of the animal in certain of those offerings was, was, was put onto the, the burnt altar, that, that altar, or it was poured there. But with this one, the first thing they did was the priest took that, that blood and he went past the altar of burnt offering into the holy place. And when he got into the holy place, he would go to the altar of incense. All right? You had the shoe bread, the table of the shoe bread on one side. You had the, the candlestick on the other side. But in the middle, right at the opening, where you would go into the holiest of holies, was the altar of incense. And upon the altar of incense was, was, was that that concoction that God gave to Moses and the priest to put on it and it was it was forever to be burning right always being a sweet smell that was going unto God what was that was representative of prayer right it was the constant prayer that was going unto God and that was what was at the opening of the holiest of holies and so when a sin offering was was made they would take the blood of that sin offering and he would carry that blood into the holy place and when he got to the the altar of incense he would dip his finger in that and then seven times he would sprinkle on the altar of incense that blood and then he would turn around and he would go back out of the holy place and he would go back to the altar of burnt offerings and he would take that blood and he would pour it around the altar of burnt offerings right the rest of the blood was put there but you see the picture (laughs) see God Jesus had to take his blood unto the Father. The only way you're getting behind that curtain, Paul, is if there's blood that is put there in your place that will allow you the opportunity into the presence of God. And that's why the sin offering was the offering that was used in the Passover and the Pentecost and the Feast of the Tabernacles and Yom Kippur or the Great Day of Expiation. All of those things. The the, the sin offering was used. Why? Because it was blood that was being offered for sin. And how do you think you get to God today? The blood of Jesus Christ had to be offered for your sin, right? And that was offered unto God on that altar of incense. Jesus offered his own blood, and that unto God was a sweet-smelling savor, and he received that as the payment for sin, and that opened up the curtain for you and I to do what they couldn't do, and that was go on in, yeah. right? They, the, the high priest could go in once a year, but nobody else was allowed in. Why? Because they really didn't get rid of sin with those offerings. They atoned for them. They covered them. No, our sin was purged. Our sin is gone through the better blood of Jesus Christ, the better sacrifice of our our sacrifice, Jesus, and that purged our sins and made us clean, white as snow, perfect on the inside, and therefore we have that access unto the Father they never had. It's a better way. It's a better way. But the sin offering is the picture of what Jesus did for our sin nature as he was making a way for us to be reconciled to God. I made a note, the burn offering, and I'm in number six here, but the burn offering tells who Christ is, but the sin offering tells what Christ did. In the burnt offering, Christ meets the demands of God's high and holy standard, while the sin offering meets the needs of desperate, sinful man. The sin offering is what dealt with with the real issue, and that was your sin and mine, which didn't exist until the law, the giving of the law. Now, at the giving of the law, every man became guilty before God, and therefore there had to be expiation of those sins. And this was how God said they were to do it. Number one was for sins of ignorance, and number two was sins committed deliberately. And so you have two different offerings. Both of them required, both of them necessary, 
one for the sin nature and one for the sin act. And God made a way. When he gave the law and made every man guilty, he also made an offering that made a way for sin to be atoned for. What a God. What a wonderful, (laughs) what love was shown and displayed to the children of Israel. The burnt offering was voluntary, but the sin offering was commanded. The burnt offering ascended, right? Remember, everything from the burnt offering, everything was was burnt up, and everything went up unto God. But on the sin offering, it was poured down. The blood, the blood went down. On the, on the burnt offerings and the others, they, they were all just put on that fire, and they, they went up unto God. But, but this, the blood specifically, it was sprinkled, and then it was poured out representing perfectly the death of our Lord and what he would do to make man, (laughs) to make a way for man to be saved. All right. Before we jump into the types of sinner, no, again, these were all sins of ignorance. But from verse number three to the end of the chapter, he segregates the violator of each sin of ignorance. Four different types of sinners are given here in the rest of this chapter. And we'll look at each one of them. Any questions before we move on? Okay. So, somebody was talking theology, and I, I don't, I mean, like, you know, sometimes you get in those conversations and it can become a little bit confusing. But, um, and it wasn't in the preacher that I was listening to. And, um, this one pocket uh, of what his statement and his statement was that when we were saved then all of our sins were paid for, covered done away with for our life so then the question was all of my sins were covered at salvation when I commit a sin after salvation, why am I asking for forgiveness? Because it was already paid during salvation, which I don't believe that. Yeah. But trying to, un- tr- but we do say that. Like we say, all my sins are gone. We say that all my sins are gone at salvation. Yeah. So when we were saved, it seems as if more of what maybe this, you could almost relate it to this, is to say that was that sin nature that maybe we were saved from for that ability to go to heaven. But again, for that relationship part, that's yep. where you're asking for forgiveness on a daily basis. Correct? And that's the difference. Yep. Okay. That's the diff- That's exactly right. That's the difference. Is one establishes our relationship with God, which is a relationship that he said can't be broken because that Price ultimately paid for all of my sin. But in order to remain in fellowship with God, those sins I commit on purpose must have an offering. Now, it's the same offering for us. It's still Christ. And so his blood, in effect, is still saving me. Right? Not not just am I saved, but I am being saved every day. Not necessarily from hell because that work was done by the blood. But, but then there's the sin that I commit, right? Not sins of omission, but sins of commission. That's what we'll find is that in the trespass offering, that's what you'll find is that then has to be dealt with the deliberate act and what Jesus had to do to cover that. Now, it was also the shedding of blood. Again, which is for us one sacrifice. That'll only have to be offered once. He was offered and was sufficient to cover all of those needs, all five offerings that they had to, to follow. That's a good question. And, and doctrinally important, right? Else, else you, you, you chase a rabbit down, down a direction that you'll, you'll never get it straightened out. But, but if we go back and look at what he gave to Moses, he dealt with it in the very beginning. Right? He dealt with sin nature of man, but then he also dealt with your naughtiness. Right? 
and you're at right, and, and, and you actually trespass against God because of the first one, you're a sinner by nature. Right? So one caused the other. But even, even in that regard, Christ is our offering. Christ has paid that sin debt. And that's why I think it's, I think it's wonderfully relevant to see that he has two. He has the sin offering and the trespass offering. And I think that splits it up for us. The trespass offering being what you have to do every day, which is die to yourself and receive right, forgiveness of God because you have confessed your sin. <laughs> Getting ahead of myself, but when we get to the trespass offering, that's what you'll learn is that one of the things that was required, well, we even see it in part in the sin offering, but one of the things that was required was a confession. Duh, right? We know that, right? Because that's part of that fellowship process for us is that if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just. How is he just in forgiving you of your sin? <laughs> Through the blood of Jesus Christ. The same blood that saved you and created the relationship is the blood that is going to do what what the trespass offering blood did, and that was to forgive them of their committed sin that they did on purpose, that they were just guilty of. So, anyway, that's a good question. Somebody else? <coughs> All right, I was going to read Hebrews 10 um, in reference to the sins of ignorance. All right, and, and, and that's what we're talking about with the sin offering, is the sins of ignorance. So let's see if we can dive in. We may not even get done with the sins of ignorance um, study before we get to the type of sinner. But there are four sinners that show up at the last part of this, or, or, or in chapter number four. But we got to understand what sins of ignorance are. Um, so let's see if we can... Open up that. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 26. Here's what it says. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. Now, we're going to see how that all plays out. But note, that when it, comes to, when it comes to sin, it matters whether or not you did it willfully or it was a sin of ignorance. And so hopefully that opens up to us. If a man sinned willfully, the sin offering did not avail them. Okay, if you sinned willfully, this offering, the sin offering specifically, could not help you because it was not for willful sin. It, it gets a little challenging here, but think of it this way. A man that willfully sins, according to the law of Moses, was to die, right? There, was, there were different judgments for different sins, right? But if they willfully sinned, right? They wanted to sin. They were deliberately in sin. There were consequences for sin, and let's just say that it was adultery and you were guilty of it and you, you willfully did it and, and, well, the law of Moses said you're to be stoned. End of story. There really wasn't a payment for that. There was judgment for that. And that's what happened. And so we find that sins of ignorance are something that, that, that is different. And, and so if it was willingly done, right, if, that we're talking about sins of ignorance here willingly sinning doesn't fall under this for atonement. The sin offering was specifically for the sin nature and sins of ignorance. It's kind of like this. There's no salvation for a person who willfully rejects the offer of Jesus Christ. There's no other, there's no other offering. But if you willfully reject Jesus Christ, you miss out. Totally on heaven. You're stoned and gone. You miss out if you willfully reject Jesus Christ as your offering. But if you receive him as your offering, there's life. Sins of ignorance, I'm on B now. Sins of ignorance reveal the truth that man is a sinner by nature. And I think we'll see that as we look at it. You're a sinner whether you want to be or not. Now, a lot of people don't believe that, right? 
You ask a person if they're going to heaven, yeah, why? Because I'm pretty good, right? I'm basically good. I'm as good as he is, right? The story goes on. And, and you know, they continue to try to justify themselves based off the standard, which is corrupt, right? Because if they're looking at the preacher and they say, I'm as good as the preacher, well, <laughs> your, your standard was faulty, right? You have to compare yourself to the perfect Lamb of God and say, well, am I as perfect as Christ? And the answer is always no, you're not. And so when it comes right down to it, we're all sinners before God. And so there is no good person. Jesus said, no, not one. All right? And if Jesus said there's not one, only the Father, then I can assure you the rest of us fall into a bucket that makes us guilty. And yet some of our sins are sins of ignorance. Now, you can imagine where they were, right? The children of Israel had never seen the Ten Commandments, right? We've seen them all of our life. They'd never seen them until the day Moses walked off the mountain. And not only did he have Ten Commandments, he had a bunch of stuff, ordinances. He had a bunch of other things that were tied to that, right? Laws and things and and judgments and consequences and all that stuff. Moses brought off the mountain and, man, he, he put it on them. Well, these people had never heard that before. Right? And so, so they, you know, here they are. And, you know, one man does something that breaks the commandment of God, and then Moses says, and this is sin. And he reads the sin, and the guy says, ah, I, I didn't know. What a God <laughs> made a way for sins of ignorance. And that's the first one he's talking about, is the sins of ignorance. And that one becomes... That one becomes the offering that they use from then on. Not because man doesn't sin willfully, but because man is by nature a sinner. And you got to deal with man's heart problem first. And if you can ever see that he gets born again through the sin offering, then God will work through the trespass offering to clean up his life one problem at a time. All right. You're a sinner in the eyes of God and do those things that are contrary to the Almighty God. Now, let's, let's define sin. Sin is any transgression of the law of God. And these people had received the law of God, and they now were learning what all of that meant. But let's go to Romans chapter number 5. If you'll turn in your Bible with it, because it's, it's uh, six or eight verses here that I want to read. But they're, they're relevant. Now, in light of what we've learned already, who's got to watch? I forgot mine tonight. Oh, my goodness. So, um, so, where was I? That messed me up. Thank you, David. He's got me a clock up there now. Um, Romans chapter number 5, verse number 12. Now, as I read these, th- think about what we're reading. <laughs> I love this stuff. Think about what we're reading here in light of what we just heard about the sin offering. Well, here's where we start. Verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man, what man? Adam, Adam, that man. Wherefore, by as one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, see it? Right? Are you with me? You reading your Bible? For until the law, sin was not in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. When did the law come? At Moses, right? When when we're reading in Leviticus, that's when the law came. Nevertheless, he said, nevertheless, even though there wasn't a law, nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But here's how he answers that dilemma, right? Because there was no law, and yet he said, Adam died. Why did Adam die? Because he was a sinner. Wait a minute. I thought you said sin was not imputed when there is no law. He's explaining that. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one, many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace 
which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift for that for the judgment. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more. They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, which is obviously Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. There's law. Even so, by the righteousness of one, Jesus Christ, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. All right? It wasn't that Adam wasn't a sinner. When he sinned, him and Eve sinned in the garden, and all of their offspring inherited that sin nature. Every one of them. They inherited that sin nature. But it was when the law was introduced that the offense that sin began to abound. What made it so great? It was because the law now declared it wrong and we were still guilty of it. And so the offense abounded for this reason. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. So the sin offering gave a profound conviction of sin, right? Because because what the law did was it said, you're a sinner, right? Now you could read, I'm a sinner. Right now you had, you had something that was a, a law that when you looked upon it, you were able to then measure yourself to it and you ultimately found that you're, you was guilty and therefore had need of sin offering. The sin offering gave a profound conviction of sin upon man, establishing man's great guilt and sickness before God and creating his need for a remedy. You see, without the law, you would never be sick. In your eyes before God, you'd never be sick. Right? Why? Because we justify ourselves and we tell ourselves we're good. But what does the law say about you? You're not good. And so it's the law that brings you to that awareness that I am guilty before God and makes me a sinner. And once I get sick spiritually, I have to have a remedy for that sickness. And that's how we get saved is that it brings us to that place of conviction and we recognize that we're sinners and that our only hope is Jesus Christ. Psalms 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me. Now, why did he write it like that? Because what David recognized was is that there could be sin in there I'm not even aware of. There could be something in my life that... Uh, Job did it this way, right? Remember that in Job chapter number one, what it said about him and how he prayed for his kids. He prayed for his kids' sins. And he offered sacrifices, not this one, but the other sacrifices, the burnt offerings, he offered for his children in case they sinned and didn't know it. These are sins of ignorance. All right, number E. Christ is the answer, the remedy to man's great conviction of sin. Again, Christ is the only remedy. The sins of ignorance were the sins committed that they were unaware that it was sin. When it comes right down to it, when we pray, right? Uh, you know, you might, Roger, take, the, take the, the attitude when you go to God that you ain't got nothing wrong. But, but because you're a good theologian, right? You just know the Bible so well. You're going to say, God, if I have sinned, please forgive me. Okay, now, in this case, that is biblical, 
right? Because if you mean, if you mean that, right? Because if you're, what you're really saying is, God, there could be something that you haven't revealed to me or I'm not aware of yet. And, and honestly, we want to be right with God. Thank God there was an atonement for that kind of stuff. But the truth is, is that if, I bet if you just guessed at what you might be guilty of, you'd probably guess it, right? It just, you wasn't willing to own it. Uh, if a man sinned through ignorance or by accident, God made provision for him through the sin offering. As a matter of fact, and you can read this in Numbers, if a man killed another man by accident, remember reading that stuff in Numbers, right? And it, you, know, you kill somebody and you didn't mean to, Okay, you're still guilty of killing somebody, but but you didn't mean to kill them. So what God did for those men was he made a place where you could go and you wouldn't die, right? You, they, they weren't allowed to seek you in these cities of refuge. You could run to a city of refuge and they weren't allowed, his kinfolk, they weren't allowed to come in for retribution and an eye for an eye kind of deal. They weren't able to take your life because God made a provision for them. Why? Because they didn't mean to. He didn't mean to. What a God, right? He's, he done thought of everything before we could get in trouble of it. So he, he done figured out what needed to be done to help, and he helped them. First John 2 and 1, my little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Again, Jesus Christ is our sin offering. Let's look at it this way. First Timothy Chapter number 1, verse 13. Here's where we see the Apostle Paul use it. Who was before a blasphemer. He's talking about himself now. Paul is talking about himself before he got saved. Who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. Okay, don't say anything, Jerry, but I'm going to use you as an example here, right? You've told us all how mean you were before you got saved. And all of those things, for the most part at least, you probably did in ignorance because of the unbelief in your heart. But when a man believes in God, right, then we lose a lot of that sin of ignorance. But before you got saved, Paul said, I did a, I did a lot of bad stuff. And he said, I obtained the mercy of God because, honestly, I did it in, un I was an unbeliever and I did it ignorantly. That's powerful. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant <laughs> with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, he said, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom, he said, I'm chief. I I'm, I'm just the worst of the worst. He said, but God made a way through his great grace. Again, that's what God was doing through the sin offering was having grace for the people that even though they sinned against him, they did it ignorantly. Last one. We'll stop here. Hebrews 10 verse 8. Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin. All right. He just talked about a bunch of these offerings that we have learned about. And Paul was talking about him here. And he said, when, when the prophet was talking about sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, what he said was, is he, he, he said, thou wouldest not. Meaning that God, would, God wasn't really interested as much in, in those five offerings. Because what we know about those five offerings is that they, they really didn't purge sin. They just atoned for it. They just covered it. So he said, neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. And I believe this explains that even the sin offering was not what God really required. But only Christ could be the ultimate offering for our sin nature as well as our sin acts. All right, so, so to wet your whistle for next Wednesday... What we do now is having learned about the sin offering, uh, wonderful, which got us through verse 2. <laughs> now we see the types of sinners and what was required. And I think this is really interesting. He starts with the high priest. It says priests, but I think it's the high priest, but uh, 
He starts with the priests. Then he goes to the congregation, the sins of the congregation, or as we might read it, the sins of a nation. And then he goes to the sins of rulers, and then finally to the sins of the common people. And so he breaks down sins of ignorance into four different sinners and addresses what is to be offered for each one, and they do vary for reasons that we'll get into. All right. Okay, any questions? Comments? Michael? Amen to that. <clears throat> yep, that is so true. Amen. Amen. Huh? That's not offered him wrong. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, it's. I'm glad also that we're not under that. <laughs> like, not, not that kind of, I'm not, yeah. I'm not judged for the sacrifice because I didn't give it. Yeah. You know, he gave it, he gave it right, he did it right. You know, but there's a lot of times in my work, they're going to show me how to put a bump together. You need to show me twice. Yep. And these sons of Aaron go to do some incense offering. They give God some strange fire. He, yeah. 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 Them. Yep. I mean, they just learned this stuff. <laughs> you know? I mean, but they did it with wrong intent. True. Yeah, he, he knew the motive of the heart. And, and the motive of the heart was the punishment, not the yep. I did it in ignorance or they did it in ignorance. They did it with ill intent. I think, that, I think had they done it in ignorance, it might have been a different yeah. outcome. Yeah. Kind of like Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right? Well, I mean, they gave a bunch of money to the church. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but God said, you lied. <laughs> right? And he wasn't interested about the amount they gave more than he was the, the intent of their heart. And they were dead on the spot. Mm-hmm. Yep. And, and Achan, right? That's, Achan's a great example as well. Because um, Achan sinned, and guess who suffered? The whole nation. Yeah. I was working on a message this week, ain't got it done, but... But Achan's sin affected way more than him. There's a bunch of people died because of his sin. Anyway, that thank God grace did much more abound where sin abounded, right? And it was the law that made sin abound because the offense really got great when the law was introduced. The, the, the offense abounded. Thank God for the grace that did much more abound for us Amen. through Christ. What a Savior. What a Savior. <laughs> what a Savior. Thank God. Amen. All right. Someone else. The work that people had to put in back then, with their sins to be forgiven. I mean, they, there's a lot of go get a lamb, go do this, spread it. Certain place, certain place. How much easier it is. <laughs> That's all we got to do is go to Jesus Christ and confess our sins to him. Why don't we do it? Right. Why don't we all do it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what if back, like Justin said, we had to do that now? Right. Right. People I, won't do, wouldn't do that. I mean, but how easy it is now. And and the other thing we don't we often forget, it's not that we don't know, but the other thing we often let slip is the cost. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. What they what we're fixing to talk about next is is bullocks. They they had to offer young bullocks, which is the most prized animal anywhere among them. They they had to give it. To pay this sin off. That was expensive. Speaking to what? How awful your sin is in the eyes of God. But wasn't our Lord the most precious in value? You can't put a value on Christ. The most precious thing that could have ever had to be offered. He was offered. That's right. 
God paid the most expensive price that could ever be paid for the likes of you mm -hmm. and you and me. Yeah. We forget that. Yeah. Amen. We forget that. And we come into the church, you know, I don't care. No, 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 no. You, you just forgot what was paid for you. Our perspective gets all out of whack in this world because we forget the price that had to be paid for us to go free. Thank God, thank God. That's the reason we ought to worship when we come together because he's worthy of that. All the time he's worthy of that. Yeah, I feel like that's why you know our communion services are so serious because, I mean, in those few days beforehand, yeah. you know, I mean, that's... What Emily and I talk about almost every year is just the weight that, you know, when we go to prepare the stuff to bring, you know, to bring out yep. and set everything up, it's like, number one, you know, the simplicity of it is such a beautiful thing because, I mean, you have the blood and you have the bread, you know, and, and what a beautiful picture of the simplicity of it. But I've, I've heard it said before, you know, salvation, it's a very simple thing, but it's not easy. Because you have to deny yourself and acknowledge the fact that Christ is the only way. And, you know, we, we, we take those few days to consider, you know, yeah. what it was that was done on our behalf and so that we don't have to do yeah. all those things. I mean, you, you read it on the front yeah. of this table every time you come in. Well, most of us don't read it no more, right? Yeah. We, we just don't notice it, right, because we've seen it a thousand times. But it, but it says what we need to remember, it's him. And, and the preciousness of that price. And so we can, we can, we, we, we find out, all right, you need to get me started here, but we find <laughs> out that, that in John 3, 16, there's one little word, two letters in this word, and it is so. Oh, if we could unpack what so means. For God, so loved the world, right? What, you, what is it? It's speaking to the value of the gift. Yes. That's right. Yes. Thank God. Thank God. And so that's why it should be so solemn as we remember the price that had to be paid to rescue us. Mm -hmm. Thank the Lord. Amen. We should never not be affected by the power of that gift that was given, that satisfied the requirements of all five offerings. In one man, the God-man, Christ. Thank God. Amen. Hey, you know, well, we should all be saying that. Thank God, thank God. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. Yeah. He washed it. Why is that? That's what these offerings are about. Yeah. It is showing us Christ. Yeah. Who he was and what he did. And we're now seeing what he did in the sin offering. And we'll get to the trespass offering here directly. But thank God for the offering that was made through Christ our Redeemer. Amen. I love him, don't you? Amen. <laughs> I love him. Thank God. <coughs> All right. That's good. Somebody else? Share your heart. Our hearts and minds are clear. Mm -hmm.